<laughs> the fucking Metatopia that I went to and I completely forgot to pack underwear. That ranks up like among my top 10 personal nightmares. <laughs> well, fortunately for us, there was a department store literally across the street. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I was a little uncomfortable, but I wasn't, you know, going commando all weekend. We had a we had a fun little adventure where we went and bought a whole bunch of cute underwear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A bunch of con underwear. We were just like, oh, you know what? Actually, there's a solution to this problem. That's a department store right there. So, <laughs> let's take my stinky ass down there. Welcome to bonus experience. Welcome to bonus experience. <laughs> you did it. I'm still sort of experience. filling out this outline. <laughs> you sure are. I'm watching your little cursor go. Uh, <laughs> we're a podcast with a deeper look at the play experience and the finer details of running and writing games. We are queer people speaking with authority about games. And yes, we swear. Die mad about it. Die mad about it. <laughs> Die mad about it. I'm Ray, industry professional. I specialize in uh, setting design, narrative design, and fiction. Oh, doing the doing the whole thing today. Mm-hmm. I like yeah, it. I'm feeling it. Cool. I'm I'm Monica. Uh, I'm an industry professional too. I'm a systems guy. <laughs> 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 I do the I do the numbers. Yeah, uh, you know I I barely understand statistics, but I am a dice pool whisperer. <laughs> something about the click clack speaks to you yeah I, if i tell you your dice pool's fucked i'm 99 percent right <laughs> you can say no but you would be wrong, wrong. Yeah. Uh, also a developer um and a, a person who is often in charge of the cats that make games uh, i'm so one of those cats you are often um you and many other people i frequently heard the cats <laughs> <laughs> So we're actually sometimes I sometimes I spend too long in the litter box. <laughs> uh, so we're today's... but I never I never barf in your shoes. You have never barfed in my <laughs> shoes, and for that I am eternally grateful. Uh, today we're actually going to talk about a topic that's kind of more in the arena of making games. Uh, but I think the topic also applies to good GMing too. This is sort of oh, yeah, a, absolutely. A, a hand in hand story craft thing, um, mm -hmm. which is both important for creating your setting and your conflict, but also for like running your game. Uh, and so, yeah, we're going to talk about conflict and how it's necessary. Uh, wow. Mm. And how it's necessary for any <laughs> game. Uh, and Sorry. Yeah, a lot of coffee. It's okay. Uh, I have that a, one was for all those weird pervs out there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, conflict. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and yes, we we even me. It's necessary for any game, uh, even the ones that are entirely focused on storytelling, and maybe even especially then. Yeah. You. Yes. We, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're not gonna call out any like specific games by name, but there seems to be this focus on if it's going to be cozy or idyllic, it doesn't need conflict, which is not true <laughs> it's not the case um so okay so conflict conflict yeah what do, right? what, what do we mean by conflict oh uh, you know <laughs> it's it's you know it's just like a struggle <laughs> between like two opposing forces you've got you know external conflict internal conflict man versus man man versus self man versus nature man versus god no. <laughs> yeah, just you know, your just, literary, just, just your, your literary Just stuff. your literary conventions. Just your conflict. Um, a conflict is anything standing between your protagonist and their goal. Um, so it stands to reason that in order to have a conflict, your protagonists also need to have a goal, too. Um, they need to want something, and at least one, and there should be at least one reason why they can't just have it. That's where your conflict lies. Yeah, uh, and conflict doesn't have to mean violence. Uh, I think a lot of TTRPG folks got that D&D &D and vampire brain rot where fighting is a thing that has to happen. 
Um, and don't get me wrong, I love games where you can fight, obviously. Oh, yeah. Zelda's mechanical developer, so... <laughs> Zelda Essence mechanical developer, not the overall one. That's Vance. Sorry, Dan. Not trying to take your place, Vance, yet. Uh, but that's not the Did only... Did you say yet? Just... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyway. <laughs> uh, but that's Vance. not... <laughs> Protect the... yourself, oh, Vance. <laughs> but that's not She's the coming. only... <laughs> Murder Vance and wear their sad robes. <laughs> <laughs> I have never met them in person, but I would hazard I'm probably taller than they are. I mean, that's a pretty good guess for, like, anyone on Earth. <laughs> yeah, that's not true. There's a lot of people who are taller than me. You are taller than most. It's right, true. Anyway, anyway so, it, conflict. Com uh, fights are not the only way to present conflict. Um, like, if right. you want to make a yes. game about exploration, the conflict is perhaps the environment or... Yeah, economic, economic or political polities trying to control the space. Man versus society. Saying. Yes, uh, <laughs> and none of these things necessitate violence. Yes, it, it, none of these need to have coming to blows. It's just what stands in the way. It could be they don't have the money, they don't have the power, they don't have the resources, they don't have the status, they don't have the, the they don't have the magical components to cast all their spells. Um, so why is this necessary for storytelling? So your story, and therefore your game, whether that is the game you are writing or the game you're running, needs to be about something. Period. <laughs> <laughs> like even that even... sounds like that sounds like a no shit, but like hang hang on. Yeah, yeah, hang on. Hold, hold on here. <laughs> um, like you need to have something to have stories about. Even microscope tells you to ask a question to be answered when you zoom into those person to person scenes. Right. Uh right. Which is meant to be, like, a reflective of some sort of struggle or something that you feel needs to be answered. You might be role-playing through an emotional struggle or a class of personalities uh, or whatever. Without some kind of conflict, you have a setting and nothing else. Right. Um, and I know that we bring up Microscope because it's mostly about setting. Right. But the 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 biggest draw of like the actual role playing aspect of it requires you to have a question with an unclear answer before you actually begin a role playing scene and the question can be as vague as what happens when these two are together or it could be as specific as why did the king betray his people to the invaders you have to you you play to find out you play to find out the answer as you know the 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 famous like you know powered by the apocalypse motive for for players and storytellers you play to find out if there's no question to answer there's nothing to find out you're just sort of describing a scene and people are talking about how cool they are <laughs> which i've been to that party and it's boring <laughs> a, a game a game post conflict is just a vignette at most there's there's no uncertainty to it and there's no question to be answered um although really I would say that it's almost impossible to have a game or a story with absolutely no conflict because there's always a question to be asked, even if the question is simply, how can we have fun playing the game today? Um, these questions are, are weak, obviously. They, they don't really generate a lot of interest. If your question is just, you know, well, how does the magic system work? That's really not that interesting unless you're here to read a textbook. Um, so in this case, I, I think instead of just talking about how do we have a conflict, we should clarify that we mean compelling conflicts. How do you have a good conflict? Yeah, because when you are creating a campaign or creating your own game, you need something that compels people to want to participate, period. Yes. yes. That's, that's the crux of what we're talking about here. So what kind of things make for compelling conflict? Well, you have to have stakes. We have to have some sort of interest in what's happening. Like Monica said, we need to to want to care about what's happening. Not only do we need to know what the protagonist or your party or your characters want and why they can't have this thing, but we also need to know what will happen if they can't get it, which should be, it should be dire, it should be dramatic, it should be interesting. If your character, their whole motivation is, I want to get married to this, you know, beautiful prince and then live happily ever after, you need to come up with what will happen if they don't get married to that beautiful prince. Because if it's just like, yeah, they get on with their lives, like nobody cares. <laughs> it's not interesting. If, if it's something like, you know, they will uh, 
die in misery or they will enter in a suicide pact with said prince because they can't have each other or, you know, like it, it has to be something compelling. Otherwise, you can have this question, but everyone will see it and go, who gives a fuck? <laughs> Yeah, uh, stakes could be a threat to a character's life, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, like no, you just no. said, they have to, it has to be something where if they don't get it, something bad happens. Or it something... should bring a huge change, change to their life, right. but it doesn't have to end their life. Right. Uh, and they don't have to be character specific either. Um, they could be factional or regional or environmental. Uh, like uh, you could, I'm going to keep going back to the exploration game. Um, because you could be playing people who are uh, scientists documenting an alien planet, like not not colonizing it, like just uh, documenting and observing it, learning about its okay. life or yeah. whatever. Um, yeah. For the purpose of study, but it's a hostile environment. Like there are monsters or um, extreme, you know, let's not use monsters because that leans like veers directly into combat. Um, let's say that it's just a planet where the, the atmosphere is toxic and, uh, it has extremely dangerous weather patterns. Uh, yeah. So yeah, your conflict, nature, right? Sure. So your, <laughs> so your conflict there is perhaps this game where the stakes are, you are the scientist, you're trying to get these samples so that you can study it and like learn about this place. Um, but you have to wear all this protective equipment that is in danger of being, uh, breached and then you might right. be exposed to the toxic environment or you have to so do the this six here are that you could you could suffer you know physical damage right from the weather right but it could also be that you know this represents a lot of resources sunk into this research team if you fail or return with nothing your reputation is on the line yeah or you know all these all this resource all these resources that they poured into your study will go to waste and now you have to like somehow make up for that loss right and then that might make it more complicated to get to go explore another planet later uh, or you mm -hmm. could be on the surface of this hazardous planet trying to just get a fucking soil sample um, but you know you only have like 15 minutes to get it out of there before this devastating dust storm blows through so then you have a race against time yeah yeah, uh, yeah. and all of these things like the, the thing about the reputation or the thing about the race against time are not necessarily threats to the character's life Right, they would just represent uh, a change that no one wants to have happen. <laughs> right. Let's let's imagine that the terrible storm that's going to kick up will not kill your character. It's not like, like if you stood outside in a hurricane, unless you got like hit by a tree, you're probably not going to die. You're just going to get really wet, <laughs> or like maybe hurt. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's maybe but it's, it's but like it might a, destroy your equipment and it might destroy or it's your like safety a certain gear. kind of like space radiation that'll mutate you if you're out in it too long and now you've got four arms right or want that <laughs> or if we're just playing scientists who are trying to get samples it might destroy the sample or or turn up the soil that you were trying to get the sample of or like introduce a new factor that wasn't there before and so your previous tests and studies are now all useless and so now you see how you can use stakes to make something like digging in the dirt really interesting. interesting. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> On the subject of making digging in the dirt really interesting, perhaps it's time to do our mid-episode break. How does that, how is that on how the subject that, of how that? Is that how is it's, that related? It isn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's the joke. <laughs> Thank you for explaining that joke. <laughs> It, it was just a non sequitur. I thought it was funny. <laughs> it was. Thank you. <laughs> BXP and the mid-episode break room are brought to you by the Misdirected Mark Network. Bing! Thank you. I'm going to get a triangle in here one day and actually <laughs> make a real, like, bing, and you'll be like, what? What? Yeah, it will blow my little, <laughs> tiny little mind. Um... <laughs> <laughs> become a bxp patron uh patrons get to chat with us directly uh they get special discord roles uh and they get exclusive hangouts which i think we've done at least one at this point yeah yeah, yeah. uh I, yeah yeah you get all of that and you and you can um you can gently introduce new emoji into our fragile emoji ecology <laughs> it, it will take me two weeks to add them but 
Yeah, they have to be introduced like slowly so that it's not a shock to the system. <laughs> like putting a goldfish in a new tank. <laughs> you gotta put the little drops in it so they don't get too stressed out. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and you can do all of this for as little as a dollar a month. If you'd rather support BXP without committing to monthly payments, you can still buy us a coffee, which is ko-fi.com slash bonus EXP. Is that the correct I believe it is. URL? I think you okay. fixed it a while ago. You can buy us a coffee, correct URL now, and you could also buy our stuff, which we have listed on our website, like the stuff that we made, you know, like, because we make things because we're like, a, we're like professionals. We, we, we people, hired so a here's, professional to make so, stuff for us. So people pay us money mm -hmm. to write words, not very oh, much yes, money. Those words. People okay. pay us money to write words and we put those words in an email and then two years later <laughs> they're printed on paper and then we get to go to the official discord and watch people complain about those words. Yeah, it's um, incredible. It's it's a beautiful cycle. Also, don't forget, bonus experience is sponsored. Mm -hmm. Bonus experience is sponsored by Nerdy Cappy. You can get all kinds of amazing queer swag, and also, also. exclusive bonus experience merchandise, which we worked very hard on by sending Spider lots of emails. <laughs> 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 we we have a whole we have the bonus experience collection on nerdy keppy i'm so fucking excited please go to nerdykeppy.com use bxp cast at checkout for 10 percent off and buy a whole bunch of fucking bonus experience stuff you can get scatter logo you can get our classic logo you can get it in black and white you can also get our special lacroix spoof lo our bubbly logos it's oh i'm gonna get so many mugs I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get mugs. I'm gonna get a couple of fidget spinners. <laughs> we got we got mugs. We got buttons. We got fidget spinners. We oh, have. I gotta get my pop socket. I, we <laughs> got a pop, pop socket. socket. I. Uh, we, we should tell you that the drawstring bag is enormous, which is why it it's costs, huge. which is why it costs thirty dollars. Uh, we it, thought it would be a dice bag. It is not. <laughs> no, it is a bag for your dice bags. Um, it's the mega might, dice bag. There might be a dice bag closer to dice bag size option. We'll have to go back in. Uh, I <laughs> ran a quick poll past our patrons who were like, "Keep the big bag." So, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, it'll make stick a great... it on your head. Wear it as a hood. Yeah. Uh, put all your dice bags in the big bag. Uh, Spider mm -hmm, pointed out mm -hmm. that it would make a fantastic laundry bag for when you're traveling which sparked yeah. our whole probably our whole cold open about being stinky <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes yeah yes. also saying um, nice things is always free leave us a good review on apple podcasts podbean google wherever uh, and help us get more listeners we appreciate you we appreciate you do you want to talk about us on your discords too. yeah yeah tell like, your friends talk about just like talk about us just tell your friends how cool we are <laughs> tell your friends how uncool you know, we are because that's really apparently cool. our appeal no yeah tell us tell them how uncool we are because that's one of our charm points <laughs> if you like bonus experience you'll also like the lounge doc finds the best to the brightest the most fun game designers and sits down to have a cool chat with them <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't know why I delivered it like that. I don't know why you did either. Um, you never know what conversation is going to come up in the lounge. Doc deserves better than that from us. <laughs> Doc is such a cool guy. I'm sorry, Doc. The lounge is awesome. We've been on the lounge before. We Doc should be on the lounge honestly again. Hilarious. We should be on the lounge again. Uh, to and be honest. Uh, didn't we invade? Like we brought our we, break room into the lounge. <laughs> we did. Uh, also, at some point in the future, I'm going to be on Unplaytested doing a game design jam with uh, Alex and Laura. Uh, oh, cool! So we'll we'll make sure that we do a shout out whenever that. Comes oh, and out. I'm going to be on Mage the podcast again here soon. I need to get back into contact with Terry because I'm terrible at being in contact with people. But Terry wants to talk to me about the Dark Tower. <laughs> oh, okay. We don't even like. He was like, "How do we make this about Mage?" I was like, "I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Let's just talk about the Dark Tower." <laughs> oh, this is my reminder to myself to email Terry. I know. Right, cool. I know Terry so has a like a side thing for the mage the podcast patreon where he just talks to someone he likes just about anything and i feel like that's oh. maybe a that's maybe a good thing for you two to do for that it's like what you yeah. plan or something like that it, it's about anything other than your work yeah yeah well definitely fucking i really like the dark tower all right so <laughs> and now over. back to get out of here kick you out Okay. Oh Monica. Boy. Yeah.
Monica? Yeah. How can I introduce conflict into my setting? We've okay. talked a lot about stuff that kind of works at a GM level, but right. how does it work at a game writer, game developer level? Yeah, I realize I wrote step one and then I didn't write any other steps. <laughs> <laughs> there is only one step. Step one. <laughs> of one. <laughs> Think about what the fuck do player characters do in your game, which also absolutely applies to GM with story games. Um, characters have to have something to do, period. Um, let's <laughs> use Man in the Stag as an example, because we, we reviewed that. Um, if you haven't listened to it, you should go listen to it. It's available. Now, Bo presents the fairy tale world. <laughs> it of, exists. It exists. It sure is there. <laughs> Uh, I should really maybe be happier about my own body of work. <laughs> it exists, comma. It sure is there. there. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of those days. Uh, Bo presents yeah. the fairy tale world of the cops as automatically having some kind of conflict simply by the differing personalities of the man and the stag. Uh, one character wants a thing. The, another character wants something different. That's literally the crux of the whole thing. Boom. That, and it's conflict. It's very, very simple. Baked right into the systems, honestly. Yep. Um, but starting from the, the basic of what do your player characters do in your game, that, that kind of builds on some, some I guess, 101, like, earlier episodes that we talked about, like, with your, when, when we talked about skill lists and our skill list exam or episode, things like that. Uh, once you figure out what you want your characters to do in your game, like this is a game of exploration. This is a game of uh, small, you know, like petty court political intrigue. This is a game of adventure and romance. Once you figure out the things that you want your character to be able to do, you can start to figure out the things that will keep them from doing those things. <laughs> that's that's your conflict. If you have a, like, okay, we go back to the the game that you've brought up about you know, scientists exploring these uncharted worlds. You want your characters to be able to, say, uh, collect specimens and study them, and you want them to actually, like, physically go out into the wilderness and identify things because, you know, there's real, there's excitement, there's potential in failing to identify something that could be dangerous. Um, so on top of that, you need to know what are going to, what, what will be the forces that stop them? And if you wanted to go back to the, the 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 Western literary conceits of man versus self, man versus man, man versus nature, man versus God. And when I say man, I mean the bullshit, like canonical, like man means human. I just, you know. We could, we could say protagonist or character. Protagonist, right. Um, if this is, this sounds like, you know, a game of scientists exploring these uncharted worlds falls really heavily into protagonist versus nature, as I kept interrupting Monica with, because I thought I was being very funny. Um, so a lot of your conflict will come from the nature, the environments themselves. So you need to come up with your conflict rules based on what does the environment do to the players? How does it get in their way? What sort of obstacles does it present? as like a setting yes. you know what i mean so here's actually a case where exalted is a good example i'm actually going to use it for this one and our next point uh, oh exalted is rife with conflict it's points. so it's so full of conflict so there's good. so much to do like there there is I mean, it sort of explodes it it's not like there's a big sort of through line of what to do but it sort of explodes it out into all the places you can be uh like there's that one city in the north that's just just beset by monsters uh, and like, yeah. and like, there's this, the, you know, the the big major metropolitan trade city on one of the biggest, uh, most important rivers in the world. Uh, also has a whole bunch of crazy tombs that are basically D and D dungeons, but weirder. Yes. Uh, in it. Yes. And like, <laughs> uh, not you could have a whole game set just within Nexus, yeah. the big city. Mm -hmm. You could also have a whole game set within just a specific borough of nexus, nexus. <laughs> like that's how that's how many that's how granular exalted gets with like do you want this to be about you know fighting the system do you want this to be about fighting crime <laughs> do you want this to be about fighting your internal demons like exalted has a lot of different points of conflict yeah uh and you you have like on a on a cosmic level the fact that 
the whole literal world is a floating island of stability inside the primordial chaos, which is constantly lapping at its metaphorical shores. Uh, Mm -hmm. And when shit goes bad, that threatens to flood in and destroy everything. Like that. (laughs) So you, you have it from that scale to like the crime boss in this neighborhood in Nexus is causing problems. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah it's wonderful it's wonderful you can zoom all the way out you can zoom all the way in it's got it's got a lot of breadth to its scope and you um, can have a game that starts in with like oh we are our, our circle started in the borough of nexus taking down crime uh or taking over the crime exalted be like that being gay and doing crimes uh and then uh-huh, it, and uh-huh. then as you get more powerful it gets wider to the point where, like, now, your last arc That doesn't is... mean that we're saying this is the only way to do conflict. No, your game absolutely should be, not. like, dripping with points of conflict. No. Exalted is just the first thing that comes to mind because we're fucking obsessed with Exalted. And also, if we you... often use it as a bad example of things. <laughs> yeah, this is a <laughs> shining good example. Um, conversely, you could turn to games like D&D, where the points of conflict are are kind of limited um you you'll find unique conflicts in their modules where they talk about you know these these whole adventures that take you from level one to whatever in these specific locales with these unique like threats and dangers but mostly those conflicts come down to there's one big bad doing bad shit you have to go fight and kill them yeah um so in D D, the conflict is really like what do you want? Who do you have to kill to go get it? <laughs> <laughs> you might argue with me and say, no, but the D&D, you could do lots of stuff with that, to which I would quote D's like, rampant Twitter post at you, which is if you're not using D&D to play conflict, you're not, or to play combat, you're not really playing D&D anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's a topic for its own episode. Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe we'll get D again and we'll do a deep dive. Oh yeah, that'd be a really good deep dive. That would be good. Yeah. Um, so I can talk until I'm boo in the face about conflict and setting because mm-hmm. that's one of my big things. But yeah. like, how do we do this for mechanics? How do you introduce con- conflict to your mechanics? Oh man, there's a lot of ways you can do this, and obviously, like combat system is the easiest and most direct. Duh. Right. That's right. how hard do you hit? How much damage does he take? When does he fall down? Right. But Make there, his number reach zero. There are lots of other excellent examples of conflict mechanics outside of combat. Um, here's another case where Exalted is a really good example. Um, because intimacies are a fantastic way to show conflict between what people want and value. Uh, and yes. the social yeah. system reflects leveraging someone's cares and desires to get them to do what you want. Yeah, it's intimacies basically serve as a press here for conflict button. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Instead of like trying to figure out what does your character want? How can we like make it? It's it, exalted. It's like you have to give me a list of the things your character cares about. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, it's good. It's straightforward. It's just, just hand me the list. I'll check them off as I fuck with them. <laughs> and and <laughs> social interaction, like the social interaction rules are about my desires are in conflict with yours. Uh, and mm-hmm. we have to either reach some sort of accord or not. And like the struggle there having nothing to do with violence, but yes. literally a person versus person, character versus character that isn't physical at all. Right. Um, yes, exactly. Let's talk about blades in the dark and going to war, <laughs> Ooh, which technically okay. is like, which on a, on a character level is violent, but the idea of like damaging your re- relationship between factions and stuff is a factional level conflict mechanic. Yes. And, and honestly, I really like it as much as the faction game and blades can kind of overwhelm certain people. Cause it, it presents this huge list of potential factions to deal with. Mm-hmm. I, I always do like a real, like very precise, like a la carte of like, okay, I'm only going to choose like four of these guys to care about. Um, but yeah, they, you actually like keep track of, how the factions feel about each other, including your players who represent a faction. And once it reaches a low enough point, you straight up go to war, which doesn't mean, oh, they're fighting in the streets. It, it means they're going to do everything they can to undermine you, no matter what you're doing. Right? Yep. Uh, in, <laughs> in the same vein, um, Apocalypse World's fronts. Oh, fronts are so good. Yeah, fronts oh, are so good. I actually... I, this is one of those things where I, I we should probably do a, an episode later about 
the the interaction between game design and fiction writing. Mm-hmm. I straight up use fronts to plan out like outlines for stories because Apocalypse World is fucking chef kiss. Like they fucking nailed it. <laughs> they nailed how to come up with with antagonists that are relevant to your characters, antagonists that have just enough detail to them that you know exactly what they're going to do and what they want. It's fronts are good. Oh, fronts are very good. Yeah. Uh, fronts are excellent. Um, can we maybe do like a quick rundown in case somebody doesn't know what the fuck we're talking about? Oh yeah. Yeah. For the two people who have not yet caved and <laughs> read powered by the apocalypse, anything. Yeah. Well, they're, especially they're apocalypse really, world. They're really an apocalypse world thing. So let's, uh, well, they're in, they're in dungeon world. There's, there's, True. I think there's, one other game I'm familiar with, I can't even remember it now. Because I know Monster of the Week doesn't use fronts, but mm-hmm. they use something else. But it's just as good. They use the countdown. The mm-hmm. countdown is also very good. Um, anyway, sorry. Yeah, okay. So um, Apocalypse World fronts, our, they, they are basically the other factions or entities or threats that exist around your players. And when you come up with a front, you have to come up with what kind of front it is like is it and there's a couple of examples that they give you in the game there's the warlord who has their like their own set of motivations and they represent like a big dude and his army of big dudes there's the mob which is like a leaderless like group of guys who might you know menace your characters there's a landscape front which is just like there's some weird shit out in the environment um and they all have their own motivations. Like uh, one of the warlord motivations is just to like divide and conquer. One of the landscape motivations could be to uh, birth badness, to just barf forth evil. <laughs> um, and on top of the motivations, you come up with a scarcity. The thing that that drives their motivation. Like what are they lacking? What do they want basically? And why can't they have it? Hey, conflict, right? Yep, yep, yeah. yep. And it, it's just it's just very good. Like you you come you from after the front after you come up with the scarcity, their motivation. Um, you come up with um, what they what they'll basically the countdown that they 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 um, my words. Oh, <laughs> the countdown is 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 detailed a little more in Monster, Monster of the, of the week, week where yeah. they like give you like a very specific like five things that happen if your players don't get involved, and then in. Um, uh, apocalypse world is just like list out a couple of steps like what happens at this point what happens next what happens next mm-hmm. um and start to foreshadow it off screen or start to sh- start to show that it, you know use your moves um but fronts are great fronts have fronts have clocks like you know blades in the dark because blades in the dark is heavily influenced by this um fronts have you know fronts have their own fluid Oh, I don't fucking man. They're Powered good. by the apocalypse is so fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, I, I, it's, it's not just good because of the gameplay. It's good because of how it's influenced by fiction. Mm-hmm. And I don't, and I'll have to do that episode later. I'm going to add it yeah. to the outline. Okay, cool. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm into it. Uh, so we can even, we've talked about sort of a little bit more crunchier games. We can also go back to looking at the man in the stack again, um, which basically has a scene changing and like, topic changing timeline in the way you flip cards yes right uh so it also introduces conflict by creating topics for each story which are like there's all these keywords that you can like create a whole story based on um and then like you are supposed to flip the card and then like figure out what each of your characters or the characters in the scene want and then create conflict around that so even at a most uh, simple storytelling direction mechanic that's still introducing conflict right because the the scene can't start without the question of what's going to happen how do i get what i want do i get what, what I, I want, want right do you get what you want uh yeah, conflict man also perhaps one of my favorite conflict inclusions at a very simple level is all of lady blackbird <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> I, I i think that comes from having like that brief dossier of your character because they just straight up tell you yeah. here's what this character wants <laughs> it, 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 it is a paragraph of what the core conflict is lady blackbird is fleeing her homeland to go run away to get married uh and uh-huh, this crew uh-huh. of people is dragged along with her and here's what all of them want here are a whole bunch of other things even... that could appear and then like the... doesn't it also pose the questions directly like 
will the pirate king still want her when she shows up? Oh, yeah. Will she be captured? Mm -hmm. Like, they pose the questions for you. Like, here's the things that will probably matter to your players. So it's fucking great. It is. It's (laughs) fantastic. And it's basically just roll some D6s. And and then, like, everything else, like, it's all condition-based. So, like, you could be tired. You could be lost. You could be hurt or whatever. Uh, And it's all just, like, it's literally powered entirely by conflict. And you're mm-hmm. you're rolling, mm-hmm. indicating how fucked you are. <laughs> because when yeah. you when you fail a roll, you get all your dice back. Like you basically build a little pool, and then you have a pool you can spend out of to make your dice pools bigger to increase your chances of success, obviously. Um, and whenever you fail, you get all those dice back, and then you're then it gets worse, and then you try again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's so that's so simple and yet so compelling because it's literally propelled forward on conflict. Yes. Yep. The whole fail forward thing, but you know. Yeah. In a way that makes sense. Yep. I don't have I don't think well, I have anything else to add here. Unless you want to talk well, about Fate Accelerated as being another really simple example. Well oh, Fate Accelerated? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. Nah. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to talk about. I mean, um, Fate Accelerated has no setting for me to glom onto for for conflict within the mechanics. No, nah, can't okay. think of anything. <laughs> Sorry, Fate Accelerated. Nah, it's okay. it's cool. uh, Monica. Yes. Where can they find our show? They can find our show at bxpcast.com, which is part of the Misdirected Mark Network. Bing. Thank you. Yeah. Where could they email us? They can email us at bonusexpcast at gmail.com. Drop us suggestions for games we should review. Oh, yes. We have another review coming out. Or it might already be out. I don't know how don't this is going to work. Gonna... This one, I think, might come out in between them, unless I can convince oh, okay. someone to edit one of our, our crazy things, which I, I did on yeah, Fuck PayPal, by the, the way. we need crazy thing. Okay. All right. Uh, how about Twitter? Can uh, we get us on Twitter? Yeah. Ping us at Twitter, at bonusexpcast. And you can you can suggest us um, games there too. I fixed the if this then that widget. It no longer tweets a broken image. Oh, thank goodness! Please okay. clap. <laughs> I'm proud of you. It was so easy to fix that, and I just didn't you do it. You fixed that. I unfucked PayPal. We're on top of it this week. That's like the ADHD. It's ADHD colon. It was so easy to fix that, and I just didn't do it. <laughs> I'm also on Twitter. I'm uh, at Ray W. Cole right now. It's a lot of progress shots of an exalted project that I'm doing for free because I'm a fucking maniac. <laughs> I did my best to not talk about it at all in this episode bliss. because it's like all I've been doing for a week and I'm trying to give my brain a break. <sighs> Pursue your oh, bliss. Yeah, it's so good, and I'm I'm so excited. This is the first time in a long time that writing something has just kind of made you feel come good out of me. Yeah. Yes, I understand that. Yes, yeah. And I'm drawing again because yeah. I got the pencil that you recommended, and I have Procreate, oh, and Procreate, Procreate is, is oh my god, so good. It's a fucking game changer. I'm finally drawing again. Pro- like that that uh, that alone should be like like a glowing review. Procreate like I, I have makes it look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you and went. It's, you it's, went to school for this. I didn't. Yeah. Well, it's. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's completely it's it's just frictionless. Like if I wanted to do any digital art before, I'd have to dig out my tablet, find the pen, plug in my tablet, load up the program, get a canvas going, figure out how I was going to do the sketching. With Procreate, it's like I get my pencil, I tap the icon. I open a new canvas and it's like, cool, get to work. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's, you can tell that it was designed by digital artists. It's, it's just very, very well designed yeah. and I love Procreate very much. And you can just, you just draw right on your iPad screen. Just like you, you would, just, draw. just draw right there. Like you would doodle on a piece of paper. You found at work. Uh, I was worried there'd be lag because I've used like digital, digital devices before that have like lag to them and they just don't feel right. But Procreate feels so good. Yeah, you don't even. And I'm not even using like a top of the line iPad. Yeah, I was just going to say you don't even need a good iPad. Nah. <sighs> anyway, Procreate, sponsor us. Uh, everybody get out. Yeah, let's go. I, I, <laughs> oh, oh, I'm at Zenith Sun on Twitter. I forgot. We, we, oh, we did I really tell you? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> uh, follow me on Twitter. Um, I'm, Blaseball is on for the rest of the week. Probably by the time this comes out, we'll, it'll be on break again, and I'll be tweeting again. But I don't go on Twitter while baseball is happening because it gives me something else to do. <laughs> <laughs>
The Great American Plastime. <laughs> yep. The cultural event of Blaseball. Uh, which the I've, cultural event of Blaseball. Which I've spent the last, like, two weeks being obsessed with. I so finally you know your bliss. Yeah, chase your bliss. I have drawn a lot of Blaseball fan art because I finally have a community that I like being in. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I'm leaving. Okay, yeah, we should go. Change it if you want it's to. Lunch, it's lunchtime for me. Change it if you want Change to. It. I gotta go eat lunch, too. Yeah, yeah, okay. <sighs> that's it, huh? Yep, that's it. That was a good that's one. It. We're definitely not saying anything else. Nope. Definitely no other catchphrases. Oh, right. Yeah, don't break it if it's not broken. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had forgotten about it, and you could have just let that one go, and yet. <laughs> it felt wrong. It felt like I was, I felt like I was taking advantage of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. Bonus Experience is written and produced by Monica and Ray. The podcast theme song is reused Morse with Light by Analog by Measure, used under the Attribution Non-Commercial Creative Commons license. Our cover art and logo are by the very talented Nemo Studios. And now, I return to the incredibly high-stakes world of children's card games. See you next time, and remember, winners don't do drugs.